Today you're going to learn how to use the new contrast optimizer method in Photomatix Pro 5. Hi, I'm Klaus Hermann from farbspielphoto.com. In the last video I've shown you what the new features of Photomatix Pro 5 are. And probably the most important one of these is the contrast optimizer. The contrast optimizer is a new tone mapping method that is tailored to produce more realistic results than the well-known details enhancer. Now the details enhancer is what probably 95% of all photographers out there are using and it produces this distinct HDR look that you're probably very familiar with. But the results can be very extreme and unnatural if you're not careful. With the contrast optimizer the possible settings are more limited and centered around a natural look. It has less sliders which help you arrive at a natural looking HDR more easily and more quickly. Now let's look at the contrast optimizer in action. Once you've opened a series of bracketed photos in Photomatix Pro 5, you will be taken to the HDR view here, which shows you the actual 32-bit HDR image as it was merged by Photomatix. To go to the contrast optimizer, just click on the tone map fuse button here on the left side. Now the first thing that you will probably see is the details enhancer method. And this method comes with a lot of parameters grouped into different sections. And it was quite easy to get tangled up in all these settings. And the amount of settings that you could produce here is actually so big that you can even go very extreme, as you probably know when you go to various sites on the internet and look at the HDR images. Now to open the contrast optimizer, just open the method drop down here and click on contrast optimizer and you will be taken to this new tone mapping algorithm. And the first thing that you will see is the left side where the settings are is very simple. So we essentially get two groups of settings. The first three sliders are the, the basic tone mapping sliders that decide about the basic look that you will achieve with this algorithm. And the second group lets you set very basic exposure stuff like the white clipping or the black clipping, the contrast and the color saturation and temperature. So the contrast optimizer is very simple. The first thing that you may want to do when you start working with the contrast optimizer is to click on the reset button down here. Now that essentially takes you to a preset called balanced and you can also see this preset in the presets panel here on the right side and you can click on this preset or, or click on reset and you will be taken to the same set of basic parameters here. Now once you start developing the settings for your image, you may want to first work on the white clip and the black clip. Um, so, so the white clip and the black clip essentially set the white and black point, as you would do with a levels adjustment layer in Photoshop for example. And what you would like to achieve when you do this is to see that you have no clipping in the in your image. And to do this, it's best to bring out the histogram. Now when you open the histogram panel, you see on the far left side and on the far right side, there are these pixels that are piling up. And that means you have clipping in your, in your image. And you can cure that by, for example, bringing, out the, bringing down the white clip. And if you bring down the white clip, your image gets darker and those pixels piling up on the right side disappear. And you can see, you can also see this in the, in the sky here with these clouds. We have spots that are easily blown out. And if I increase the white clip, you see that we've got a white block of pixels here and that's not what you want. So make sure that there's no clipping going on. We do the same for the black clip here. And you see that the pixels here on the far left side start disappearing until we get an image where neither the, the shadows are blocked up nor the highlights are blown out. So that's the very first thing that you should be doing. Now the, the second thing is to work on this tone compression parameter here. And this tone compression parameter essentially brings the highlights and the shadows into the middle. So if you drag that to the far left, to a value of minus 10, you will get an image where the highlights and the shadows are spread out over the histogram. And if you bring it to the far right, to a value of plus 10, you see that if you look at the histogram here, that the 
pixels start to go into the middle. So you bring the highlights areas and the shadow areas closer together, which means that you're compressing the tones in your image. What's apparent here is that this doesn't influence the black clip or the white clip. And that's why we were setting these two values before we work on the tone compression. So whatever I do with this tone compression slider, you will see that there are no pixels piling up on the right and on the, on the left side. So that's the first important point for the workflow with the contrast optimizer. First, work on the black and white clip uh, values, then go to the tone compression. And if, I, if you set this tone compression, just have a look at the image and see where you get, get to a point when you like the overall appearance. And I think for this image, it's just about at the minus four point, which where it starts looking um, right to me. With this image, we've got uh, a bottom section, which is rather dark and a sky, which is rather bright. And at about minus four, we've got a nice balance here, which is still looking natural to me. Now, the next thing that you should be doing is working on the lighting effects. And this lighting effects slider is very similar to the lighting effects you see in the details enhancer um, algorithm, but it's less extreme. And um, this lighting effects uh, slider basically adjusts the local contrast. So while you, when you uh, change the tone compression here, you work on the global contrast more or less, the lighting effects creates details, little details, um, and works on the local contrast. And the more you bring that to the right, the more unnatural the image will start to look. Now we've got a setting where the bottom is really bright and the, the, sky, the clouds here in the sky start looking a bit dark. So I'm not going to this extreme. I'm going to be fine just around the 30 mark, I think, here. Now. While I've done all of this, the strength slider, the first slider that you see has been uh, steady at 50. So I haven't changed it in any way. And that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to raise the strength to increase or decrease the overall effect. And you see, if I pull the slider to the right, you see that the tonal compression is um, a bit more extreme. If I pull it to the left, you see that the bottom gets darker and the sky gets a bit brighter. And just play with this slider until you find a point where the particular image looks right. Now, as for all the other tone mapping algorithms out there, this is not a one fits all parameter setting, which I'm showing you right now. You have to adjust these parameters for each image individually, because each image looks a bit different under the same set of parameters. So this is just for this particular image. Now I think I'm going to decrease the white clip just a little bit more here to avoid the clipping in the sky. Also the black clip here. And that looks just about fine to me for the very basic parameters that you can set. Now the next thing that you can do, which you should be doing after you set all the other parameters as I've shown you, is the contrast. And the contrast is a bit different than what you think of contrast when you go to Photoshop or any, any other imaging, image editing software. Because when I drag that um, contrast slider all the way to the right, you see that the image gets really dark. And I'm not sure whether that's by design or whether it's a glitch in, in the beta version, which this is. Um, but the contrast slider seems to work on the, on the shadows only. If I drag that to the far left, you see that the image gets very bright. And you see that these mountains are shifted to the right. When I drag it to the right, first to the middle, you see that these mountains are wandering towards the left. And if I drag it to, to all the way to the far right end, you see that the histogram, or the most pixels of the histogram are squashed to the extreme left end of the um, of the scale here, which means that everything is really, 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 really dark. So keep that in mind when you're working on the contrast. You should make only very little changes here. 
to avoid this overall darkish look of your image. And the last two sliders are color saturation, color temperature. These are very straightforward. The first slider will increase your saturation overall in the entire image. So be careful with that. I think for this image, just right about the, the 4.0 mark should be fine here. And the color temperature, of course, sets the uh, temperature of the colors in your image. So if you go to the right, you get a warmer look. If you go to the left, you get a cooler look and everything starts looking a bit bluish here. For this particular image, I will go somewhere to around like 2.5 or something to get a nice warm look here. So let me summarize what I found to be the best workflow for the contrast optimizer. The first thing that I do is I set the white clip and the black clip to make sure that we have no clipping in our image because clipping always means that you're losing details in the highlights and or in the shadows. The second thing that I do is I work on the tone compression to make sure that the overall contrast between the shadow areas and the highlight areas is adequate, is good for the particular image. The next thing I do is I work on the lighting effects to make sure that the local contrast is good. And then I work on the strength to make the effect more or less apparent. And then the last thing that I'm doing is I'm, I'm setting the contrast for the particular image and then maybe the saturation and the temperature. But saturation and temperature are two things that you can do easily in Photoshop and more effectively actually in Photoshop. So I'll probably leave these to the post-processing workflow after the image leaves Photomatix. Now let's compare the image that we've just created with two versions that I've tone mapped with the details enhancer method. And we're here in Adobe Bridge and I've got these three images open. And the first thing, the first one is uh, a tone mapped image with the details enhancer. And you see that we've got this typical flat look, which is um, essentially um, a result of the, uh, of setting the white point to zero or close to zero in the details enhancer. And I'm doing this to avoid the clipping. So the same that we did to the contrast optimizer, where we set the white clip, can be done in the details enhancer by setting the white point. And I'm usually setting it to a value of zero, which means that no clipping is uh, appearing here. And that usually means that we've got this washed out flat look. I've tried a second version here, which is a bit more contrasty, but let me just switch between these two details enhancer versions and then I'm going to the contrast optimizer version. And you can immediately see that it's got a better overall appearance. The contrast is nicer. We've got less washed out overall look. You can see that this little uh, monastery here in the, in the middle comes out really nicely. In these details enhancer versions here, it's quite washed out. And here you see it's just a more pleasing overall appearance that we can create with the contrast optimizer method. The contrast optimizer is a nice addition to Photomatix as it allows you to concentrate on creating a natural look. In fact, making images look unnatural with the contrast optimizer is quite difficult. You can achieve a similar type of look with the details enhancer, but your images will look more washed out, especially if you're trying to preserve the highlights. Now, deciphering what each of the sliders does and how they interact is still a bit difficult, but you can use the general workflow that I've been showing you and achieve a good base setting. From there, a bit of experimentation will take you to the result you want. That's it for this hands-on photo tip. As always, if you've enjoyed it, if you found it useful and interesting, make sure you give me a thumbs up wherever you're watching this. To stay in touch, simply subscribe to my YouTube channel or follow me on any of the big social networks. I'm Klaus Hermann. Thanks for watching.